Hello, everyone. My name is Jason Scott Benoit. I'm the coordinator of the Transitions and Engagement Office at the Center for Academic Excellence here at Lawrence University. And for the next little while, I'll be giving an instructional video on how to effectively register for your courses. Now, before I start, I just want to let you all know that I'll be visiting my own personal self-service account, to walk you through the process of how to register for courses uh, for the fall and the winter term at Laurentian University. So I'm gonna go ahead here and share my screen, bring up my own my.laurentian.ca account. Now, one thing that I would like to share before we do get started is that if you are a new student to Laurentian and you don't see the same options that you do see here in my own account, it's possible that you haven't completed the onboarding process, which means that you've yet to activate your student accounts. Now, once you've completed the onboarding process, you will see your student account look very much the same as mine. Of course, your photo will likely be different. Uh, but that being said, you'll have all the same services that you would see here on my screen. Um, so in order to, if you, if you don't see the same as this and you're seeing on the left hand side, something like book a scheduled campus tour or visit your documents, apply to residence. Um, it's likely that you're still in that applicant student phase. So in order to create that onboarding process, finish that questionnaire and activate your student accounts, you'll want to visit my.laurentian.ca slash start. And once you do, you'll be prompted to share your first and last name, your student number and date of birth in order to complete the onboarding questionnaire, which will only take you a few minutes. Once you do, you'll have full access to the same student portal as you see here on my screen, which will allow you to continue with course registration, access your course content, navigate your Laurentian email account, and access a number of services that are available to you as a student at Laurentian University. So before I get started with the self-service platform, I just wanna highlight a couple of important pieces that'll be really crucial and important for you to, um, to track and follow along while you study here at Laurentian University. So the first would be to follow through, uh, I would say on a regular basis, and um, check your Laurentian email address. So now that you're a student at Laurentian, any communications from different departments, your professors, your, your colleagues, will be communicating you at your Laurentian email address, which can be found here in the top right corner of your My Laurentian account. So simply clicking the envelope icon will bring you to your Gmail platform using your Laurentian email address. And what's cool about your access to the Gmail platform with your Laurentian account is that Laurentian University has the enterprise suite to the G Suite platform. So you'll have access to all of the applications that Gmail has to offer, like Google Sheets, Google Docs, uh, Google Slides, your Google Calendar, which will be very, very important um, in order to maintain good um, time management skills. Uh, you'll have access to your Google Forms, Google Tasks. So these are all things that you can navigate on your own time and get more familiar with, but will be very instrumental in your learning while you complete your courses at Laurentian. Next, you'll have your D2L account. So D2L or Desire to Learn, Brightspace D2L, is basically where you'll go to access course content for all the courses that you registered for at Laurentian. So on the first day of class, you'll have a module that'll light up in your My Courses section of your D2L account, and that will allow you to navigate your course content. It'll allow you to communicate with your professor, access your course outline or your course syllabus, and also communicate with your, uh, with your peers and your colleagues that are taking the same course as you. Your professor might ask you as well to upload your assignments via D2L. And if that's the case, you'll have a Dropbox there where you can submit your assignments. Also, if you're always on the go and find yourself um, using your mobile device a little bit more frequently, you can download the Bright Pulse, uh, Brightspace Pulse application on the, um, on the uh, Google Store or, or the iPhone Store. So that would basically allow you to log into your D2L account using your mobile device and get notifications whenever you have new content for any of the courses. Um, as well with the D2L platform, there's a self-registration module and that will allow you to register for any kind of free modules or basically basic um, free information that will support your learning at Laurentian. So there's ones on academic writing, there's another one for orientation for online students and a really useful module there about your resources as a Laurentian student. So we encourage you to check that out 
uh, and get more familiar with that before you start your classes. That way there on the first day of class, you're ready to go. I'm gonna access my self-service platform here. Um, so I've already registered for my courses for the upcoming term, but this is gonna be basically it's kind of step-by-step -step on how you go about registering for courses. It's possible that when you access your self-service account, you'll be prompted to sign in again. And that's just kind of an extra added security because there is a lot of personal and confidential information here in your MyLearnX uh, self-service account. So once you're here on the home page, you'll be prompted with four different options. The first one being your student finances. So once you've registered for courses, shortly thereafter, you'll have your financial information in this section here. Once you've completed your courses, you get your final grades through your self-service account as well. So um, as, as a kind of added piece of information, your professors at Laurentia will have 14 days after your final assignment to submit your final grades to the registrar's office. And at that point there, they'll make the update into your account to basically present what your final grades are for that respected course. So be patient a little bit um, because sometimes it does take about you know, two weeks, sometimes maybe a little bit more especially after the fall term because the university is closed for approximately a week, week and a half during the holiday break there at the end of December. So um, oftentimes you'll see that update come through the end of December or early, very early January. Then you'll have student planning, which will spend most of our time for this session. And that will allow you to view your progress and also plan and schedule your courses. And then your graduation overview is something that you'll visit near the end of your degree at Laurentian in order to iron out all those details about graduation. What you can also do is visit this checklist here on the left hand side and it'll give you basically the same options that you would see from your home page. So if you'd like to navigate this section here you can do so at any point in time throughout, um, throughout your, your, you know, while you're navigating through this account. So when we're visiting student planning like I said you'll be presented with two options here. The first being your progress and this will be very important to check and monitor throughout your degree because this is going to present you with the learning outcomes and the degree outcomes that you'll have for your undergraduate or graduate program. Here, you, if you want to kind of bypass your progress, you can go straight to the plan and registering of your courses. But for the purpose of this session here, we're going to visit the progress. And as I do that, I just want to <clears throat> highlight and make it very clear that because I'm ad, you know, basically using my own personal accounts, I am sharing some information about my degree and I will give an example of how to plan and register for a course, also how to drop a course, um, but it's important to know that the outcomes that you're seeing on your screen now with my student account um, is specific to my program, it's specific to my studies. Um, I've already graduated from Laurentian University and will be pursuing a second degree in a Bachelor of Arts with a specialization in Indigenous Studies. Um, and because of that, I've received a number of transfer credits. And because I've graduated uh, about seven years ago from Laurentian, I have completed some courses in between that time um, as a Laurentian employee, just for fun, really. Um, so that's why you'll see an added number of credits here. So rest assured, this is likely not what you'll see in your own personal account. And there still has to be a little bit of a cleanup, a bit of an update here to reflect my second degree status. Uh, but I'm not really in any rush. I kind of know my plan for the upcoming year. So uh, this will kind of settle itself in due time. Um, as you progress in your progress, you'll notice a number of outcomes and every degree will have a different number of outcomes. When you're looking at your progress here, the second bar will be your progress over the full year. And then this third bar of progress will be reflective of one academic year. So um, the top one here being your program. So my first undergraduate degree was 120 credits. My second one, because I've already completed a first degree, will only be 60 additional credits. So 60 plus 120 puts me at 180. But again, because I've completed some random courses along the way, that's why you'll see um, you know, a high number of courses here. But once that update is complete, then um, everything will kind of go back to normal. And then that last bar you'll have out of 30 is the progress for one academic year. And it's important to note that um, because as 100% course load, in most programs, with the exception of engineering, because engineering will take an overloaded semester every year for your full four years. And your degree will actually be 144 credits, not 120 like most other programs. But at 100% course load, students are taking 30 credits a year, 15 credits in the fall, 15 credits in the winter time for a total of 30. All right, so we'll continue through this and I'll show you the outcomes that I have in my second degree. 
And um, like I said, different degrees will have a different number of outcomes. If I'm not mistaken, I only have about four, maybe five. Yeah, I have four main outcomes and then a lot of them are just transfer credits. And then I have the outcome of financial literacy, which we'll speak to in a moment. But as I start here in outcome number one, it's important that you notice a bit of a difference here with outcome number one. So first, outcome number one will outline your foundation courses. So these are gonna be courses that you have to complete in order to continue into your upper years. And I'll show you how to read a course code in a minute. But one thing I do, <clears throat> excuse me, I do wanna highlight is that outcome number one is always uh, presented to you in the number of courses to complete. And for the most part, the courses will be listed very specifically in this chart, which courses you have to complete as foundation courses of your program. And just if I go quickly over to outcome number two, you can see that outcome number two is presented in the number of credits. Now I'll show you and explain to you how to um, differentiate between the value of a course in terms of your credit count. But just be mindful of the fact that outcome number one is listed in courses. So each course here on my list for a total of six, whereas every other outcome down the list will be presented in a number of credits. So as we go up to the out first outcome, I'll share with you how to read a course code and it'll be very simple because you'll see the credit count over to the right hand side. But the first four letters of your code will be the subject. So for this example here, INDG is Indigenous Studies. And for the most part, there is one exception which I'll present later, but for the most part, we simply take the subject, drop some letters in between and kind of bring that forward to a four letter code um, so, you know, usually when you understand that, it's pretty easy to find what the subject is. And then the four letters or four numbers that are follow, your first number in this example here, 1116, the first number indicates the year of your course. So a 1000 level course is a first year course, 2000 level course is a second year course, a 3000 level course is a third year course, and anything at the 4000 level will be fourth year undergraduate. Now, if you're a graduate student, You'll be looking at registering for courses at the 5,000 level. That will be your master's. Anything above that might be listed for your PhD. The other piece of information which will really highlight the credit count of your course is the last number in the code. So using the example of number six here or number seven for INDG 1017, the six or the seven indicates a three credit course. And we can see that now because I've completed these courses or when you're registered for the course, it'll also highlight the credit count here. But know that if you're finishing a course that ends with a six or a seven or a number one or a number two, they hold a three credit value. And this is a course that's one semester in length. So this course would either be offered in the fall, in the winter, or in the spring term. And again, it's a three credit course, which means it's one term in length. Now, when you see a course like INDG 3105, now we already know, because it's a 3000 level that this is a 30 year course, but you will have some courses in the course catalog that present themselves with the last number five. And that means this course is a six credit course. Now be mindful of the fact that a six credit course is a full year course. And when you're looking at your plan or your schedule, these six credit courses will fall under the 2020 fall winter term. Now, if you're looking at this video in the future, you might wanna change the year but you're still looking at that fall winter term, which means this course begins in September and finishes at the end of the winter term. Now, a good trick that I like to introduce to first year students is if you have the opportunity to take an elective course or even a foundation course in your program that's of six credit value, I encourage you to take that course because a six credit course will have your cumulative exam at the end of the winter term in April. Now, what's cool about that is that it allows you to have one less final exam in December for the fall examination period. So when it comes to your first term in university, whether you're coming from high school, another university, or a college, having one less exam in your first university term will really support a smooth transition to university and will also allow you to kind of hone in on those time management skills that you maybe are just working out in your first term of university. Now, of course, with a six credit course, um, you will have to complete that final exam at the end of the winter term in April. But at that point there, you've been in university for eight months. You've developed some really good study habits, some good time management skills over that first, first year, first full year of university. And you're ready to take on more than just 
four or three final exams. Um, assuming you're at 100% course load, you'll have five final exams at the end of your winter term in April. Um, but if you have a couple of six credit courses in your year, um, then it's a kind of one, you know, for every six credit course that you have, you have one final exam left in December. Now you will likely have a midterm exam um, in December, in the early weeks of December, maybe the first couple of days, but that would be a midterm exam where it does not fall in the examination period. Now, if for whatever reason this differs with your course, rest assured that those details will be shared with you in your course outline and your professor will communicate this with you very early in the term. Um, so be mindful of the difference between a three credit and a six credit course, because as you progress into your other outcomes, that will really play a factor because when you're looking at completing in my outcome number two, zero of six credits in an indigenous language, either series A or series B, I have the choice now to either take indigenous studies 1016, introductory to Anishinaabewan A and Anishinaabewan B. So by taking these two courses together, and usually a six uh, a course that finishes with a six will be offered in the fall as kind of a part one. And then the course that finishes with a seven would be more so a part two offered in the winter. So I would take these in kind of that chronological order where intro A, intro to Anishinaabewan A would be in the fall and intro to Anishinaabewan B would be offered in the winter term. Or if I wanted to, I can take introduction to Cree, which is a six credit course. And we know that because it finishes with the number five. So either I take this one credit course to satisfy outcome number two of six credits, or I can take two, three credit courses to again satisfy the outcome number two of completing six credits in indigenous language. Now, one thing that I will share, and uh, I'll show you how to find this document as well with the shared screen feature that I'm hosting right now. But there is a document that's very important for any student who started their studies at Laurentian after September 2019 or in September 2019. And that's the academic regulations for the Bachelor of Arts or the Bachelor of Study, uh, Science. Sorry. So even though you're not studying a Bachelor of Arts or a Bachelor of Science, this document will have a lot of really useful information. So for one, it will have the chart of course codes, the last digit to the credit value, which is useful for any student. It'll give you information about Dean's Honor List, the attendance, course overloads, letters of permission if you need to do that throughout your studies. And it'll also give you um, a really good chart on the different combinations of your degree. And I'd like to take a couple moments to speak to this because we get a lot of questions from students in first year who might have very little courses in outcome number one. So for example, a student who's studying a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology, your only required course really for outcome number one is Introduction to Psychology. And students often come up to us or they'll ask those questions to an academic advisors and say, what else do I take? Well, in your first year, it's a good opportunity to take those elective courses and declare another subject. So often in university, we talk about majors and minors, and I've majored in this with a minor in that. Um, at Laurentian, you have the flexibility of a number of different combinations based on your degree to highlight more than one subject. And especially when it comes to the real world after your university studies and you're looking for employment, uh, we like to say the more tools that you have in your toolbox, the better employee that you'll be to your employer. So the more combinations that you can have in your degree, the more employable you'll be. And specifically to students who are following education, whether it be on the French side or the English side, or even concurrent education, to be able to outline um, a, com a degree combination like uh, a major double minor would give you more than one teachable subject. In fact, it would give you three. Um, so again, looking at those options as someone who wants to pursue a career in teaching, to be able to have more than one teachable subject is, uh, is definitely a value to you going into the field of teaching to be able to teach more than one subject. And as you progress through this document here, or even just this page, you'll see what these combinations look like in the credit count for a major, a minor, or a specialization. So be mindful of this. If you have additional questions on how to really master the combinations within your degree, you can reach out to our academic advising team at academicadvising at Laurentian.ca. So as we progress, just because I'd like to get uh, a little bit further down the list here on page number nine, to outcome some of the very specific requirements that you'll see also listed as outcomes of your degree. And the first one being the linguistic awareness. So as a student studying in a Bachelor of Arts, 
you'll have to take six credits of linguistic awareness, which asks you to take six credits in a secondary language. Now, though Laurentian University is a bilingual university, it uh, doesn't mean that you have to take a course in French. So there is the list of courses that are available to you. So if you're interested in taking an indigenous language, like I showed in my outcome number two, it's something that I'll have to do as part of my degree, which by default will allow me to complete this course as my language series, but also my linguistic awareness piece. So you can take introduction to Nishnabu in A or B, A and B, introduction to Cree, introduction to Arabic, Chinese, German, Spanish, Italian, Latin, or Greek one and two. And as you can see the course codes for the most part, these are all six credit courses. And the same thing with Langue 1005, which is our aided Excel in Grand Mile. So these being six credit courses, by completing one of these, you'd satisfied your outcome of that linguistic awareness piece. Now, because I can't uh, share this link with you in the video, I will show you how to find it on Laurentian.ca. So if you visit Laurentian.ca, in the academic section, you'll find yourself at undergraduate programs. And unless you want to find your own undergraduate program, you're more than welcome. But for the sake of this example, I'll just click ancient studies because it's the first one on the list. Actually, I should have clicked communication studies because that's the program that I graduated from. But anyways, just for the sake of the example, you'll find yourself at program details. And then as you progress down, you'll look at degree options. And in the degree options, you'll look at these regulations. So this will be a hyperlink for pretty much every program in the Faculty of Arts and likely in the Faculty of Science as well. But you'll click this and you'll basically find the very same document that I'm working off of now. You can bookmark this, save it, print it. The first half is in English and the second half is in French. Um, so that will allow you to have the same information in both languages. Next, as we progressed, requirement number two is indigenous content. So Laurentian University, and we're very proud about this, is the only university in Canada to foster a tricultural environment. So we support Anglophone, Francophone, and Indigenous students on campus. And with that, we find it very important to get familiar with uh, the Indigenous content, Indigenous culture, not only here on campus at Laurentian, but also across Canada and uh, the world, really. So with that, we have a very generous list of courses that offer 50% content. 50% Indigenous content. And uh, if you want to consult this list, you're very more than welcome to do that. And uh, you basically go through and find a couple courses that are of interest to you. And one thing that's important to note as well is that you don't have to complete this outcome in your very first year. And though there are some courses at the first year level that can be used in your first year, um, you just have to complete these outcomes before graduating. So personally, I wouldn't wait too long because um, usually in those, in those upper years, you'd want to take courses that are more specific to your discipline. But uh, I mean, if you want to wait until your second or third year to take the Indigenous content, because there are some upper year courses here available, you can most certainly do that. So you'll find a, a very generous list of courses here. And maybe one thing that I'll, I'll pause on real fast is uh, these two psychology courses. And I'm just taking these courses at random here. But one piece of information that you'll find in the course code is also the language of your course. So as we already explained, you have the first four letters. So in this example here would be psychology. It's a fourth year course. It ends with a six, so it's a three credit course. But these two numbers or letters here, EL, is English lecture. And if you see the same course code, FL, it'd be a French, lec French lecture. Um, you'll also see the title in the French language, so you'll know right away that it's a French course. Uh, but just be mindful of that, that the course code also holds information about the language of instruction. And then you'll have courses, requirement number three, of scientific literacy. Um, so as a Bachelor of Arts student, I've noticed that sometimes these students get a little bit nervous about having to take scientific literacy requirement because that could be one of the reasons why you pursued a Bachelor of Arts, right? You have the choice now to study what you want. And if you're like me and you're not very strong in the sciences or don't really have an interest to go into the labs and do biology or chemistry experiments, um, again, you can consult a very generous list and um, kind of pick courses that fall under a different faculty that's not necessarily a traditional science. So again, you will have a very generous list of courses here. Uh, so courses obviously in biology, ANTR is anthropology, you'll have courses in chemistry, ENSC is environmental science, GEOL is geology, you'll have courses in math, you have courses in physics, a long list of courses in psychology. 
And uh, that basically gives you, you know, a pretty generous list. So if you're, again, if you're like me and you, you kind of want to avoid those traditional sciences, you can take something outside of that traditional science where you're not necessarily required to enter those lab spaces and conduct experiments. So as we continue, I'll show you too with my outcomes that I do have that scientific literacy that I haven't yet completed. So that's one thing where I'm going to have to consult that same list I just presented to you and find two courses or six credits uh, in order to kind of complete that outcome before I actually graduate. Outcome number three for myself would be 12 Indigenous electives at the 4,000 level. And we get this question often too from upper year students that they're presented with a list of courses, so they don't know what to take. And I'll show you in a minute using the course catalog that when you access the course catalog to basically consult the list of available courses during the registration period, you'll be able to apply filters on your search in order to isolate specific years, specific languages, or specific subjects of interest when navigating your, your, um, your search uh, for a specific course. And that really allows you to hone in on a specific course that you're looking for. Now, of course, you could click the course code and it'll bring you directly to that in the course catalog. But for a student who's not sure what 4,000 level courses are available to them in that specific subject, they can go into the course catalog, search under the subject of Indigenous Studies, and simply isolate 4,000 level or fourth year and get all the list of courses at the fourth year level. Now, the reason why we don't, uh, or I guess my example here, where it's not specific to which courses on this list, as you can see, the chart is bare. And that's just to give students the flexibility of taking courses that are of interest to them. And you'll notice that as you progress in your degree, you'll have a little bit more freedom to branch off into an area of study that's more of an interest to you. And that's really the beauty of the flexibility you have with your degree, degree at Laurentian, is that it allows you to take courses that you like and especially with your elective courses, take courses in other different disciplines or other programs of other faculties even to really kind of create that combination that's unique to you and your interests. So for myself, when I'm ready to take courses at the 4,000 level, I'll simply make that search, isolate fourth year and take courses in the subject of it that are interest to me. Um, I know for my faculty in Indigenous Studies, there's a very generous list of fourth year courses. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what that's going to look for me uh, once I get down there in a year or two. My last outcome here is outcome number four, which is completing 15 upper year Indigenous credits. Um, so what upper year means, if you're unfamiliar with that, would be anything above the first year. So an upper year course is a 2,000, 3,000, or 4,000 level course. And you can see here in my, um, in my chart that I have two courses at the second year level, a course at the third year level, I have a three credit, another three credit, and a six credit. So already, once I've completed this academic year, I'll have 12 credits. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, I have to do 15. Yeah, I have to do 15. So I'll have to take an extra three credit course. And it'll be up to me if I want to take that course at the second year, third year, or fourth year level. So for example, if I take you know, if I find a list of courses at the fourth year level that are really interesting to me and I go beyond that 12 credit count, I can place that extra course in this outcome to satisfy, you know, both and ultimately outcome number four for myself. And then I'll just be left with um, the scientific literacy, which right here would be that six credits that I've yet to begin. Right. So once I do plug in those courses, they'll automatically place themselves in this chart. And once they're completed, it'll go green. But again, just putting the accent on the fact that now you're looking at credits, right? So every outcome except for outcome number one, you're looking at a credit count, whereas outcome number one, you're looking at a course count. And again, these courses for outcome number one, they're foundation courses, and they will be presented to you. Don't be alarmed if you only see one or just a few. And that just means that those are foundation courses for you in order to take those upper year courses later on in your degree. So one thing I'll do now is I'll visit the course catalog and I'll give an example of a really, really useful course that uh, most students can take, which is A6-1006. Um, so when I said earlier, oh, I'm gonna sign in as well because it kicked me out here. And that happens sometimes if there's you know, little to no activity after a certain amount of time, then you might get timed out. You'd simply log back in, it'll bring you back to the very first or the last page that you visited. 
All right, so like I said before, those four first letters of your course code will highlight the subject, and there is one exception to the rule, and that's A6-1006. So I will find it. It's under the Center for Academic Excellence. And as you're going through the course catalog, basically everything here is listed in alphabetical order. So you can either scroll down the list or type it in the search, and then keyword search will find the subject that you want. I'm going to type in here Center for Academic Excellence, and it's going to give me seven courses available. So there is the um, ASICs for professors, the teaching dose. There's a 1,000 level course, which are for undergraduate students. And there's that 5,000 level uh, for students at the graduate level as well. So one thing that we'll do, and it'll give you a really good example of how to isolate your search based on the filters that are on the left-hand side. You're going to click, or I'm going to click anyways, 2020 fall. So already it's kind of reduced that search from seven till two. And I know these are the only two courses here, but just for the sake of example, I'm gonna go down and select the undergraduate level. I'm gonna select first year, and I'm gonna select the language. And even though for some reason, self-service recognizes both the English and French course um, to be available here as English, but when you look at the course code, we'll have French lecture, Compréhension en Français et en Kites, which is a French equivalent course. And then here you'll have A6-1006, Understanding, Learning, and Inquiry. And the reason why I'm sharing this course as an example is because it is a course that any university student can take it throughout their degree with the exception of engineering. So if you were in an engineering program, regardless of the stream, you, this course will not count towards your degree structure. You can take it if you want, but it would be something extra that would not count towards your 144 credits. All right, so be mindful of that. If you have any questions, whether you're an engineering student or not, you can email academicadvising at Laurentian.ca and they will let you know whether or not this count would be considered, this course would be considered towards your degree. All right. The reason again why I'd like to share this is because A6-1006 is like a university 101 course. This course here is designed to really strengthen your habits in university, to give you really good study habits, writing habits. It does touch a little bit on um, time management skills, managing your mental health and your stress as university students. Uh, it really helps elaborate on your research skills and kind of goes through that library database. And the reason why we kind of encourage you to take this sooner than later is that you're going to learn how to learn in this course. And the lessons that you'll learn in this course are, can be applied to all the other courses that you'll be completing from your first to your last year in university. So like I said, it's a great prep course and one that we encourage that you take uh, as a university student if it does fit in your schedule. And again, if you have any questions about what fits in your schedule and what doesn't, please consult an academic advisor and they are the experts. They will let you know whether or not this fits for your schedule or not. So we're going down the list and this is going to be a really great example to show you the difference of sections. So when you're looking at these courses, and it's very important to see and to note that when you're looking for courses in the course catalog, that you do not add the course to plan. I mean, you could, but by adding the course to the plan right here on the top, you will not be able to register for the course. And I've seen that a couple of times with students is that they have their plan schedule, um, but they don't have that button to register. And it's because they've added it to the plan. So they're planning it and they're not adding it to their section. All right, so that's important to know. Also, if you're finding a re if you're searching for courses and you don't see this box here, view available sections for A6-1006. Now, again, it might be different for the course that you're looking for, but if you don't have this drop-down menu, it's because the course is not being offered in the term that you've selected. And I've selected 2020 fall term. So, you know, by having this option here, the course is available for that term. So we see section 01, it's full, and it was offered uh, earlier in the year. <clears throat> we have section number two that's full. So these two sections here were actually offered in August as kind of a smart start uh, initiative that the Center for Academic Excellence launched prior to September, allowing students to take a course in the summer term um, while still be considered technically fall in order to have a lighter course load for the fall term. Again, putting the emphasis there on a smooth transition to that first term of university. But for students now, you can um, look at taking the course during the fall, it might also be offered in the winter. You'd want to double check on that if it's too late to add a course to your plan. Um, but basically here, you're looking at 11 seats remaining. Now I will point out to say, if a course is full and it has zero seats, 
what you can do, and I'm going to select this one here because I want to give the example of how to register for a course. But when you click add section to schedule, you'll be presented and prompted here with all the information of your course. So if your course is full, you'd want to, you can still click add section to schedule. You'll get the professor's contact information and we encourage and ask that you email the professor. And now this, this is not a guarantee every time, but by emailing the professor, you can request that they increase the capacity of the course. The professor of the course is the only person that will approve this. And if they do, they will communicate with the registrar's office or the registration office and have them register you for the course internally on the back end. And that will allow you to avoid the conflicts that the course is full. They will register that course for you manually, and then you will see it in your calendar. So if the course is full, the first person you want to contact is the professor. Write them a nice email. Um, as best as you can, have, have proper email etiquette. And, uh, and that way there, they'll give you basically the yes or the no, whether or not you can have permission to join that course that's already at capacity. But here are the seats available. There's 11, we know that. And if you're completing an undergraduate degree, you wanna make sure that the course is graded, all right? If it's not graded, you won't get your final grade. Um, so you wanna make sure that you just keep this section as is. And if you wanna revisit the course description, you're obviously more than welcome to do that. So I'm gonna add this course to my section. Now in the top right corner, you see that the uh, course 03, section 03 has been planned on the schedule. There is a difference between a planned course and a scheduled course. And what I've seen that a couple of times already with students is that they go and add it to the section, they see it's added to the schedule and they think they're done. When in fact, there is one more step in order to complete that registration process. Now, before I go to my plan, I'm gonna visit my progress to show you the difference in color between a planned course and a registered course. All right, so a planned course would be highlighted in yellow. A red, cor a red course means it's not yet completed or conflict, and a green course means it's either completed. Um, is it in here? Okay, it won't show up here. So you can see this. Oh, there you go, this is what I wanna show. So the three credits in yellow, means that I have a planned course. So that's A6-1006. Now I'm gonna head over here to plan and schedule. And what's really useful about this platform is that it does allow you to plan, right? So if you wanna plan your courses um, even one year in advance, you could, but be mindful of the fact that registration for the fall winter term is available to you earlier mid-June. Registration for the spring term <clears throat> will be available to you near the end of February. And um, so yeah, if you, I mean, if you plan courses for the spring, you'll only be able to complete your registration and confirm that information at the end of February. So I don't have, I don't have any courses in the fall term. So, oh yeah, I do, sorry, they're fall winter and I'll show you that in a moment. So this course here is planned, it's in yellow. Because it's a section between 01 and 09, it's a course that's offered either in class, but for the 2020 fall term, everything is remote, minus a few courses, less than 1% of courses are available on campus. Um, so for the most part, very most part, we're doing remote delivery. So we'll see this in the meeting information, remote delivery, which means that uh, your session will be offered via virtual classroom in either synchronous or asynchronous learning. Now, synchronous learning will be basically live. Uh, where your professor will have an online platform, most likely Zoom, and they're giving their lectures live stream. Asynchronous learning would be, uh, you'll still have your time slots in your calendar, but your professor will have recorded videos that they'll present. Uh, and some professors will do a hybrid. Some might do a combination between recorded sessions or lectures and uh, some live streaming. So the professor will let you know on the first day of class how they'll operate. And then you'd basically respect that. They'll share the Zoom link with you by email or by course syllabus. And then you kind of tune in during that class time in order to participate in your course. So when you're looking at a course like this, uh, you'll see Mondays and Wednesdays from 1.30 till 2.50, or I like to say three o'clock just to make it easy. Uh, because for every course that you have in your calendar, you're scheduled for three hours a week. You'll either have a one three-hour block or two one and a half hour sections. So it kind of depends 
uh, how the course is, uh, is offered. Most of the time, it's two one and a half hour blocks, but you will see some courses that are offered in a three hour section. Um, so to register, you'd simply click register and the registration will go from yellow to green. Now we have received the questions that you're registered but not yet started. And the reason for that is because the fall term for us hasn't started yet. So it is registered, it's in green, and green means go. So you know now with confidence the course is registered. And you can even see the difference up here between a planned and an enrolled course or credits. So there's zero courses that are planned and three courses, credits sorry, that, uh, that are enrolled. Um, I will drop this course real quick to give you a bit of an example here of what we're looking at. Um, but we use kind of like the streetlight signals. So a green means go. So if your course is completed or registered, not yet started, it'll be highlighted in green. All right. If you see a course that's planned, that means it, or in yellow, it means it's planned. So similar to a yellow light, a yellow traffic light, uh, you know, we proceed with caution. We look both ways before we cross the road. So this course means that we're planning it. We're not sure yet if we want to commit, um, but it's in our schedule. And if we change our minds later on, we're going we're gonna to go for it and put it in the plan and register that course. If you see a course that's red, it means it's either not yet completed or there's a conflict. And the system is very good about identifying what the conflict is. What I tell students is that if you're presented with a conflict when you add your course to your plan, try and register for it anyways. And if once you click register, then that conflict message comes up again, um, then, then you know that's a true conflict. And it'll let you know what the conflict is or what course this one here is conflicting with. Um, yeah, so I'll just register it again for the sake of having it in green. I just wanted to make that kind of identification there between both. And for any student who has a six credit course in their plan, I have two. So those courses will fall in, um, in, the, they'll fall in the fall winter term. So when we're looking at this term here, uh, like I mentioned before, a course that ends with a five, whether it be section 01 through 09 or section 10 through 014, um, there'll be a full year course. So it starts in the fall and it ends in the winter, okay? So for this course here, 2105, it's offered via remote delivery because it's 01, section 01. So I'll have class on Mondays from 10 to 1130s, Mondays and Thursdays. Now for courses that are listed um, 10 to 14, those courses here will fall in the sections with no meeting time. And what that means basically is this is strictly an online course. Okay, so these online courses um, have no meeting time because you're studying at your own pace. And this is often for students who are completing um, an online degree from via distance education. This is basically you'll on the first day of class in your D2L account, you'll have a module that'll be active for this respective course. You'll get the course outline. Sometimes your professor will put all the content in there on the first day of class and you follow at your own pace while abiding by the deadlines of your course. So there's no specific need to be in a remote delivery, to be in a classroom. You're studying at your own pace. If you want to do your homework at two o'clock in the morning every day, that's entirely up to you. Again, you want to respect the deadlines of your assignments, um, but you can do your, your course whenever you want, coursework whenever you want. Um, and then you still have access to your professor. So you'll get their contact information in your course outline. And that will basically allow you to reach out to them if you have any questions throughout the term, whether it be a fall, winter, or fall, winter course. Now, one thing I will highlight, because it's uh, just kind of convenient that it works out that way, is the course that I have scheduled in my 2020, win 21, 2021 winter term um, has this conflict here. The section is full. And we've received questions about this with students. But for me, we'll say that I took the last seat in the class, right? So I'm gonna see if it says the capacity, it doesn't give the capacity, but it's registered, but not started. It's highlighted in green, the green check mark. If we look at the bottom of the calendar, it's green in the section with no meeting time, but it's saying the section is full. The reason for that is because it's letting me know if I drop this course or remove it from my plan or my schedule, there's a good chance that someone who's on the waiting list might receive an email or notification saying that there's one spot left. Or someone might be going through their calendar in the course catalog and see there's one seat less than this course. So if, some, if I were to drop this course and somebody registers for it and I go back tomorrow and change my mind and want to register for it again, I might have lost my spot. 
So this is letting me know that the course is full. And for me, I'm going to use that as a precaution to keep it in the schedule, uh, especially because it's a course that I definitely want to complete as part of my degree. Now, one thing that really helps because understanding the fact that you have technically three terms here, right? The winter, the fall, winter, and the fall. If you want to see that in a condensed view, you can visit your timeline. And the timeline will actually allow you to go back to the very first term that you had at Laurentian. So if I wanted to go back, way, way back, uh, I believe it was 2007 that I completed my studies, I can go back and see every course I've ever completed at Laurentian. So um, there's that. And there's also kind of this pain view where you see your fall, your fall, winter, and your winter view all together in one. Now, sometimes students kind of get confused with the fall, winter course because they see it as a six credit course, they know it's a full year course, but it's not shown in the fall and or in the winter term. So what I advise students, or I don't advise students, what I share with students, is that take that six credit value and divide it by two. And just imagine as though there's three credits in the fall and three credits in the winter, right? So if you're looking at 12 credits enrolled for the fall winter term, imagine there's really six of them in the fall, six of them in the winter. So I have nine credits enrolled, in the fall because these fall winter courses will start in September and they'll finish in the winter term. So you can almost draw a line from fall, fall, winter to winter and kind of imagine that course being a full year course like that. Um, so under that suggestion, we'll say, or that tip, knowing that there's nine credits in the fall, nine credits in the winter, I have 18 credits in my schedule. Now as a Laurentian student, 18 credits in the schedule gives you the full-time student status, all right? So you'd have to have nine credits in the fall, nine credits in the winter, in order to be considered full-time in both terms. Um, so for example, if you have only six credits enrolled in the fall and nine credits enrolled in the winter, when you're looking at uh, making your applications for financial aid, like OSAP, for example, um, you'd be technically considered a part-time with six credits in the fall but then full-time with nine credits in the winter term. So you can actually make another application to OSAP to reflect your winter term, showing that you're a full-time student. So keep that in mind when you're making those applications. Um, often students will take 100% course load, which will see them taking five courses or 15 credits in the fall, uh, five courses and 15 credits in the winter for a total of 30 credits. Now, don't feel pressured to take 30 credits. If it's easier to, for you to focus on you know, four credits instead of five in order to focus on your studies and, and, you know, master those time management skills. That's entirely up to you. If you're an online student studying distance education and you're working full time and you have a family, it might be very difficult for you to manage five courses at a time. So don't let that degree length, that three or that four year degree length intimidate you. It took me five years to complete an undergraduate degree and it's taken other people uh, longer than that. So don't, don't be fixed on that timeline. I mean, whatever works best for you and your schedule, um, if, if it means having more success with the letter course load, just consult an academic advisor and they'll be able to let you, or, you know, provide you with a good plan going forward to share what that avenue looks best for you and your needs and your lifestyle. Um, now I'm gonna go back to my schedule and I'm gonna drop A6-1006. I'm just gonna drop it. I'll keep it as planned because I'd like to show how that looks like in your timeline. So again, it's yellow, it's planned. I'm cautious, I'll keep it there for a moment. Now, when I go back to my timeline, that planned course is listed in dark gray. And of course, it'll say it down here, planned credits, three planned credits. Uh, but just be mindful of the fact that if you do see any courses in your timeline in dark gray, shaded gray, then you know it's a planned course. Whereas the light gray courses are courses that um, are in fact confirmed and registered in your schedule. So I'm gonna go back to my scheduled view. And just to give you an idea of how to drop a course, you'll click the X, you'll remove a course, and um, that way there, it's completely removed from your schedule. And if I were to go back, it does not appear in the fall term. One thing I will mention quickly before we wrap up, actually two pieces that I'll end with. Number one, check the important dates of the university. And I'll open up another tab just to give you an idea of what that looks like, uh, Laurentian.ca slash important dates. There are important dates, for example, the first day of class, the add drop sections, so days where uh, like the di limit to add courses to your plan for every term or to drop courses from your plan at every term. 
you also have like um, your reading week. So this is maybe a better way to look at it here. We're looking at September, 2020. And then if you're looking at October, 2020 of your fall break in the fall, um, but there are some very important dates here to consider. And if you'd want to link this to your Google Calendar, you can click add to Google Calendar and you log into your Laurentian email and it'll actually add a calendar to your Google Calendar, uh, which you can click on or off. And that will basically allow you to sync these dates with your own personal calendar. Something that I do quite often because I find it's really important, especially going back to my studies to know when those dates are. And you can actually set them to kind of give you a prompt notification as well. So um, very cool stuff with this. It is one piece that I strongly recommend that you view and keep tabs on because it will be very useful going forward. And the last thing that I will say with respect to these, more specifically the six credit courses, is that they are a full year course in the fall winter. But if you're planning or registering courses in the spring, there are six credit courses that are available in the spring. All right. And the spring term is a condensed term. So normally in the fall, or in the winter, you'll have between 12 and 13 weeks to complete the course. Um, if you're taking a fall winter course, you'll have that times two. So you'll have between 24 and 26 weeks to complete the course. Our spring term is only about eight or nine weeks long. It starts on the first week of September or of May, sorry, uh, spring term. We'll start in the first week of May. Usually it's somewhere around May 4th. Uh, it's usually the first Monday of the month. And we'll go up until mid July. So for a fall, and or a winter course, a three credit course, it's manageable to complete one or even two courses in the spring term. But be mindful of the fact that if you're registering for a six credit course in the spring, it is a pretty heavy course load. Normally you'll have between 24 and 26 weeks to complete this, and now you're only about eight or nine. So it is condensed because it's the same course, same content, same workload, just in a much shorter uh, time span. Right, you have about one third of the time than you would traditionally in the fall winter. So be mindful of that um, because it is important to know that you know if you want to fast track your year for your you know your upcoming year, if you want to catch up because maybe you have a lighter course load in your previous year, that spring term can help you quite a bit. Um, but that being said, sometimes students kind of register for those courses six credits by accident, not realizing that they have much less time to complete than they would in the fall winter. So that's just a little tip and trick. Um, if you have any questions with respect to course registration, if you want support uh, identifying those degree combinations, we strongly encourage that you reach out to academic advising at Laurentian.ca. Uh, if you'd want some support in the process of navigating your My Laurentian account or your self-service account, you can reach out to orientation at Laurentian.ca. And our call, one of our colleagues can certainly uh, you know, meet with you one-on-one -on -one or provide some, some questions to, or answers to your questions. Um, if ever you want to revisit this video, we'll have it live for you. And that way there, we'll just kind of go through that process of how to go about registering for courses. Be mindful to keep an eye on your progress because your progress will um, outline every outcome that you have to complete. And oftentimes students think they have to complete all of these outcomes in their very first year. That's not at all the case. Um, you will notice yourself, and, and same in my situation, I'm completing courses in outcome number four while completing courses in outcome number one. Um, so you'll see yourself as you progress throughout your degree, kind of, you know, completing different courses and different outcomes. And then once you reach the end of your degree, you should see everything here all green and um, ready to graduate. So I thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions, you can reach out to us, orientation.laurentian.ca, and we'd be more than happy to help. I wish you the best of luck in your studies for the upcoming term. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to, uh, to reach out via email, orientation.laurentian.ca, <clears throat> and to communicate with an academic advisor, and be academic advising at laurentian.ca. So thanks very much for your time. I hope this uh, workshop and video was useful for you. And uh, again, best of luck in the upcoming term. Thank you very much.